Good evening and welcome to APP to APP virtual lectures. My name is Kara Ann Valentine. I am a nephrology PA and I'll be presenting to you today on contrast induced slash associated acute kidney injury. So my objectives for today is are to review what acute kidney injury is, discuss what contrast associated AKI is, the management of it, I be able to identify at risk patient populations for it, and discuss some preventative measures used to decrease the risk of it occurring. Just to get a sense of where we are, if you'd like to answer in the chat, you can. Here's, I'll have a few poll questions for you. So which of the following can be used to diagnose acute kidney injury? Is it a serum creatinine greater than 1.5, blood urine nitrogen level greater than 20, urine output more than 500 cc's per day, or rise in serum creatinine of 0.3 or more in a 24 to 48 hour period? Okay, no one answered, but I'll give you a D. <laughs> and we have one other person with a D as well, Amani. Okay, great. That is correct. Acute kidney injury can be used, um, be diagnosed using a rising creatinine serum creatinine level of 0.3, but within a very specific time frame, or it can be used, um, it can be diagnosed with urine output level in a specific period of time. Okay, next question. Is acetylcysteine and sodium bicarbonate currently used in the prevention of contrast-induced acute kidney injury? So we don't have any answers except for false. Okay, that is correct. It is not currently recommended to be used in the prevention of contrast-induced AKI, and we'll discuss this. The next question is, which of the following is associated with the highest risk for developing contrast-induced acute kidney injury? Is it your patient with CKD, hypertension, autoimmune disorder, or COPD? So we have one response for B. Mine would actually be A. Okay, that was kind of a trick question because hypertension is one of the leading causes of CKD, but specifically to contrast-induced AKI, the highest risk factor is CKD specifically of diabetic nephropathy type. So we'll discuss as well. But hypertension is the second leading cause of CKD, so I can see why. And the last poll question for today is, the type of contrast used does not contribute to possible development of contrast-induced acute kidney injury, true or false? Well, I'll go with that one for a false, and it looks like we do have one other person for a false, two other people for false. Okay, that is true. It is false. We uh, will discuss some of the recommended contrasts to be used if you're worried about CAAKI. Okay, just so we're all on the same page in regards to kidney terminology, AKI is acute kidney injury. However, AKI has three categories or types. We have pre-renal and Previously, we would refer to it as azotemia, but now we refer to it really specifically as acute kidney injury. Um, then we have, because azotemia is really just the elevation in BUN, and that can be caused to other things. So we, when we're talking about acute kidney injury, when we're thinking it's a pre-renal cause, we call it pre-renal AKI. We also have intrarenal or intrinsic AKI, where there's actual damage being done to the renal parenchyma. ATN, also known as acute tubular necrosis, is a leading cause for this. And our contrast-associated AKI is a type of ATN. So in nephrology, there's a lot of types and subcategories and subcategories. So just so we're all on the same page. And then the third type or category of acute kidney injury is post-renal. 
with chronic kidney disease, you'll see a, our main or leading cause in the US is diabetes mellitus. And then we have end-stage renal disease where they're uremic or symptomatic, and they have usually less than a 15% um, EGFR, that's known as your ESRD patient. But what we need to understand is when we talk about acute kidney injury, acute kidney injury can happen in a person with normal renal function, and it can be superimposed upon a patient that already has chronic kidney disease. That's why it's important to look at that rise in creatinine, because if your patient already has CKD and they have a baseline creatinine of 2.2, you'll need to be aware that an elevation of to 2.6 could indicate that they're having a superimposed acute kidney injury upon their baseline um, CKD. So what do we use? We use estimated GFR. It's one of the primary diagnostic methods for detecting and managing kidney disease. So basically we look at the eGFR to make our clinical decisions, right? Um, in nephrology, Whenever we're consulted on a patient, we are one of our primary um, orders is for the pharmacy to adjust medications based off of the eGFR. However, we have to make sure that it's the base, it's a um, a true eGFR and not like a fluctuation. So usually they'll need to be in some type of steady state. When we don't have that, because when they're hospitalized, they're not usually in a steady state. This is when we sometimes need to go off of base stuff of what we know as their baseline creatinine. So that's why having records or an idea of what baseline creatinine is primary to the uh, or prior to the disease, it could be beneficial. Um, the eGFR equation includes serum creatinine, but we're finding better um, serum biomarkers for evaluating renal function with serum cysteine C. So a lot of the new evidence-based um, calculations are, are incorporating serum cysteine C, especially with acute kidney injury. So you'll see this coming up more. Um, we base it off of age, sex, race, and or could include body weight. However, we are coming to realize, or we should have known, race is, is a social construct, not a biological one. So in recent development, they are um, the kidney community has decided that they would like to see race taken out of the equation to estimate GFR. So our kidney group leaders asserted that like race modifiers should not be included in equations to estimate kidney function. They also stated that current race-based equations should be replaced by a substitute that is accurate, accurate representative, unbiased, and provides a standardized approach to diagno diagnosing kidney diseases. So the, recommend, the research is showing that using serum creatinine and serum cysteine are more accurate than just using serum creatinine alone or just serum cysteine C alone. Um, we know that creatinine is not the best indicator of renal function, but it to this point, it was the best that we had, but we know it's less accurate in specific clinical scenarios, like if the patient has muscle wasting, they're an amputee, a bodybuilder, all of these th being on certain drugs, all of these things can affect serum creatinine levels. So that's why with this removal, why is it important? Because as I said, clinical decisions are made based off of eGFR and that um, research was showing that for certain communities, specifically the, well, it was either you are black or non-black in the um, calculation of eGFR. And what happened is with the removal of race from the equation, more black patients will have lower eGFRs in earlier stages of CKD. This is really important because earlier stages of CKD require intervention to prevent the progression to end-stage renal disease. So having this lower in G, um, Black patients will help them have access to more interventions to hopefully delay or prevent the progression to end-stage renal disease. Removal of the Black race coefficient will allow for referral to a nephrologist earlier, Medicare coverage, and potentially the need for transplant or dialysis. So 
this is why serum creatinine is not the best indicator, right? It is used to evaluate renal function by estimating the eGFR using those equations that I mentioned. But there's a large change in GFR, but little change in creatinine in initially. If you see here, from 100%, from 100% to 50% is a very minuscule change in the serum's creatinine level. And then vice versa, you can see a huge change in the serum creatinine, but not much of a change in the percentage of kidney preser um, function. So let's talk a little bit about AKI. Again, it's that impairment of the kidney filtration and its ability to excrete over days to weeks and thus results in the retention of nitrogenous and other waste products that would be normally cleared. So the criteria for that diagnosis, again, is a rise of creatinine from baseline of at least 0.3 within 48 hours or at least 50% higher than the baseline within a week. When you're outpatient, it's really hard because we don't have that creatinine level within such a limited um, short time frame. That's why it's mostly diagnosed inpatient. But if you do have that creatinine level within a week and you've seen a 50% increase, this can also be used. Or it can be the reduction in urine output to less than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour for longer than six hours. It's important though to recognize, you know, that AKI, it's a clinical diagnosis. It's not necessarily a structural one. So a patient may have AKI with or without injury to the kidney or renal parenchyma. It can range in severity from asymptomatic and transient changes in lab parameters of the EGFR to overwhelming and rapidly fatal derangements in the effective circulating volume regulation and electrolyte man, um, electrolytes and acid base status. So here's just showing the three types, the three categories of acute kidney injury. We have your pre-renal and there are the etiologies. This is usually due to some type of hypoperfusion. So it's either decreased volume, decreased pressure coming to the um, kidney. But this is without, like we said, the renal parenchyma damage. Intrinsic now, there is actual damage being done. And then post-renal is usually due to something outside of the kidney, past the kidney, that's obstruction, obstructing the outflow of urine below the kidneys. And it usually has to be bilateral or at the level of the bladder and beyond to, to see this elevation in the renal parameters. So the big one that we're talking about is with intrinsic or nephrotoxins. And you see iodine, iodine contrast is one of the main nephrotoxins, real talk. So again, ATN or acute tubular necrosis, it's a, um, a type of intrinsic AKI. It accounts for 90% of intrinsic types. Um, it's pathologic diagnosed based on the characteristics of these histologic findings. So the proximal tubules seem to be more susceptible to injury. You have the sloughing off of the brush border membrane into the lumen, and this can cause obstruction within the tubular lumen. Um, sometimes um, ATN can be a result of a persistent pre-renal type of AKI, so a hyperperfusion that's extended that will start to cause ischemia, but that's a different type of ATN we'll talk about. But ATN is usually reversible as well. So the two types of ATN are ischemic and nephrotoxic. So ischemia, again, from that prolonged hyperperfusion, the, um, the renal parenchyma, they're very sensitive to states of hypoxia, so they can be injured easily. Um, and then nephrotoxin exposure, we have two types of nephrotoxins. We have endogenous that's produced within the body or exogenous. So our radiographic contrast media is one of the more common exogenous causes of nephrotoxin ATN. So again, what happens, the filtrate, once it's filtered through the nephron, it becomes concentrated. Then the concentrated nephrotoxin 
um, will lead to the tubules becoming swollen and necrotic. This will then lead to debris that will cause the lumen to become obstructed. Then that filtrate receives that high backup pressure, which will lead to decreased GFR, which could lead to oliguria. This is just talking basic specifically to ATN. We'll talk a bit more about specifically contrast associated. So again, the kidney has very high susceptibility to nephrotoxicity due to its extremely high blood perfusion and concentration of circulating substances along the nephron where water is reabsorbed and in the medullary interstitium. This results in a high concentration exposure of toxins to tubular interstitial and endothelial cells. So what are the lab findings you'll see that you're, you should suspect acute tubular necrosis? You'll, you could see increased potassium, increased phosphorus. These are common abnormality, electrolyte abnormalities. You can see a BUN creatinine ratio of less than 20 to one. Usually if the ratio is greater than 20 to one, it's usually a pre-renal cause, but with intrinsic, you'll see a less than 20 to one. And that's because BUN and creatinine are rising um, proportionately. Um, in your urine analysis, you'll see urine sediment that is brown, and this is due to that tubular damage. So on microscopy, microscopy you might see the positive muddy brown casts or renal tubular epithelial cells, etc. If you're doing urine studies, the urine sodium, that's a specific test that needs to be ordered, you'll usually see that this level is elevated, and then the fractional excretion of sodium, again, the percentage will be high because you're excreting more sodium. But that's seen with oliguria. So what is the general treatment? Again, with nephrology, there's no pill to fix everything. So it's really important to determine the cause. So a thorough evaluation is always required. So if you don't feel confident, always feel, um, don't hesitate to consult nephrology because it, it requires a very thorough evaluation. And then what we try to do to manage or treat is to eliminate the cause if, if possible or help to um, hasten recovery. And then of course, manage any complications that could be resulting due to the injury. So we try to hasten the recovery, we stop all the nephrotoxic drugs that could worsen the situation, or if it was a nephrotoxic drug that caused the situation. We try to use preventative measures. We Hydration, we really need euvolemia. We don't want to overload the patient, but dehydration is also not good. Or volume, um, volume, um, volume depletion is not good. Um, so we, we really monitor volume status closely. We always adjust the medication dosage of any renally um, excre uh, excreted medications. And we do serial labs to see how the patient is doing, how they're recovering, and also to manage any complications that could present. So the course or prognosis of ATN in general is there's the three phases. You have injury, the maintenance, and recovery. Depending on the type of ATN, that injury could be days to weeks to months. Um, I'm sorry, the injury occurs within hours to days. And then with maintenance, you have, your patient can either be oliguric or non-oliguric. We'll see in CAAKI, they're typically non-oliguric and they have better outcomes, um, but other types of ATN could become oliguric. So their urine output is less than 500. But this stage usually is between one to three weeks, but could go up to several months. And then recovery is usually signaled by diuresis in your oliguric patients. You'll see the GFR start to increase while the BUN and serum creatinine levels to, um, start to decrease. So um, contrast associated AKI. So this is a new term that's been adopted by the community. It was previously, I'll talk more about it, but it, we, we've, known, we've known it as contrast-induced nephropathy or contrast-induced um, acute kidney injury. But the more acceptable term right now is contrast-associated AKI. So you might see those terms interchangeably. So hopefully I'm explaining well why we use one versus the other. So 
the reason why they've adopted this is because research has shown it's not possible to ex it's not always possible to exclude other causes of the acute kidney injury. So that's why they're saying a contrast associated AKI. So it could be due to hypotension, infection, other things, and not necessarily the contrast medium itself. So that's why they've adopted this term of contrast associated AKI instead. But it does include the, the term contrast induced AKI. That is when you can definitively say it was due to the contrast, as well as other AKIs co or coincident coincidental AKIs. So it's usually it's generally reversible form, although it its development may be associated with adverse outcomes. And this is why it's so important to our community because these adverse outcomes are significant, but not all get them, but we've seen high risk patients or more at risk patients that do develop these adverse outcomes. So it's, it's, it's prudent for us to know who those patients are. Um, recovery is relatively quicker than other types of ATN. This, CAAKI usually can be resolved within a few days. So by the time you realize they have it, you see you start to see recovery. So a lot of the literature is saying, is it really important then if they recover back to their baseline or not? Well, that's where the adverse outcomes plays a part, plays a role. So the theories are there's two major, two major theories of what is happening. And the first one is that it's caused by renal vasoconstriction resulting in the medullary hypoxia, possibly mediated by the effects of the viscosity and by alterations in nitric oxide, endothelian and or adenosine, and that ATN is a direct result of the cytotoxic effects of the contrast agents on the tubular cells. We also, there is also thought to be that the tubular cell injury may be exacerbated by renal vasoconstriction. They are not mutually exclusive though, so they could both be happening. And it is also possible that the decline in GFR is due to functional changes in the tubule epithelial cells rather than a true necrosis. So again, the, 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 the data out there is very varied. So, what, why CAAKI versus CIAKI? Again, it requires a very thorough evaluation and the elimination of all other possible causes of the AKI to truly say that someone has a contrast-induced AKI. But where did this all come from, right? Why did we think that iodinated contrast media was nephrotoxic? Well, it was due to um, animal experiments and uncontrolled human studies. However, because a lot of these older reports lacked comparable control groups and that did not receive contrast material, their, applicabil their apl applicability sorry, to the understanding is still unclear. So large controlled studies have su since suggested that many of the cases of AKI following the administration of contrast could have been due to coincidental other exposures, nephrotoxic exposures, like a hypovolemic state. They had, the patient had cardiac dysfunction or an infection. And these things could have been happening at the time that the contrast was administered. So CIAKI is developed is the AKI developed within one to two days. It usually has a peak around three to five days after the administration of the contrast. So it CIAKI or contrast induced nephropathy should be reserved again for those that can truly be linked causally, causally to the administration of the contrast. If other potential etiologies were not excluded, or if there are other potential etiologies that are identified, then you truly should be using the term contrast-associated AKI or post-contrast AKI. And again, it is very difficult to diagnose a truly contrast-induced AKI. So, with the peak around three to five, most of the kidney function starts to improve within three to seven days. And then the patient will either return to their baseline re renal function or close to their um, previous renal function. 
the patients that have the highest risk for having a persistent AKI post the seven days are your CKD patients. Risk for dialysis is very low with CI AKI, though it's higher in patients that have a severe underlying chronic kidney disease. Usually if a patient has AKI and they are, have, they are requiring dialysis, they had some severe underlying CKD or some other factors going. CI AKI by itself doesn't re often require the need for dialysis. So what are the features? You'll see that early, mild increase in serum creatinine. They'll be non-oliguric, so they'll still be urinating well. They may have that urinary sediment of um, ATN, the muddy brown cast. And then you may see the decreased GFR. They may have hyperkalemia. They may have acidosis and hyperphosphatemia. So early, mild increase that is within that 24 to 48 hour after the contrast exposure. And again, it's usually mild. With the non-oliguria, because the AKI is typically mild, most patients will remain non-oliguric, so they'll still have adequate urine output. If the oliguria develops immediately after the procedure, it's probably due to some other severe AKI or uh, that moderate to severe underlying CKD. So what are, what are the recommended? All of these are recommendations at this point. So the recommendations for the management of contrast-associated AKI are supportive. So we want to eliminate and avoid any other things that could possibly insult the kidney. So we're trying to preserve what is happening and help to restore. Um, we have to make sure that they're hemodynamically stable and their electrolytes are adequate, and if not, manage those things. Um, we also always want to appropriately adjust the dosage of any medications during this time. And among those with severely decreased kidney function, we need to monitor for that need of dialysis, which are those uremic signs and symptoms that they could present with. So who's at risk? What are those risk factors? Well, we have patient-related risk factors and procedure-related risk factors. So the, the ones identified by the literature are CKD patients, especially those with diabetic ne nephropathy, those with a volume-depleted state at the time of the procedure, those that have reduced renal perfusion from heart failure, and those with hemodynamic instability. In regards to the procedure-related risk factors, there's a much higher risk with arterial versus venous administration of contrast. There, it's specific to the type of procedure. There's a higher risk with interventional versus a diagnostic angiography. And the, type, the dose and the type of contrast used also plays a risk factor. So the recommendation is very small amounts of contrast have been safely used in patients even with advanced kidney disease for the examination of an AV fistula per, per se. However, a diabetic patient with a serum con concentration, sorry, serum creatinine of greater than five may be at risk from as little as 20 to 30 milliliters of contrast administration. So what this says is there's a lot of variability. It's dependent on the procedure, it's dependent, dependent on the contrast, it's dependent upon the patient status and the patient history. So here are the recommendations for the prevention of or the risk reduction of CAAKI. You want to, the first thing you also always should do is identify those who are at risk, especially those who may be at high risk for developing. So these are the mar um, criteria for identifying patients. Any patient with an EGFR less than 60 and diabetes mellitus, heart failure, liver failure, or multiple myeloma, they're at risk. If they have less than 60 and significant proteinuria, they are at risk. Proteinuria does show a higher risk for um, this development in your patients. Um, any patient with less than 45 um, EGFR, even without the presence of comorbidities or, comor uh, or proteinuria is at risk. And then your highest risk or your higher risk patients are those with less than 45 EGFR and diabetes mellitus and proteinuria, 
and all patients with the EGFR less than 30. So first you identify your patients. The second thing you wanna do is make sure your patient is not volume depleted and that they haven't, if they're using NSAIDs, they haven't used it within that peri or periprocedural time. So monitoring volume status is really important. Um, that's why some of the recommendations is to hydrate. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but just knowing if your patient is in a volume depleted state is really, is really crucial. If they're on NSAIDs, then you wanna withhold them within 24 to 48 hours of your procedures. We do not withhold ACE inhibitors and ARBs because there's insufficient data to support the benefit of withholding these medications. And then they are at risk for, a, so they're at, sorry, and there are a risk associated with resulting hypertension with holding the, these medications. So again, identify the patient. Second, make sure they're not in volume depleted state. And third, how you select your contrast dose and type. So the recommendation is to use the lowest effective dose of contrast possible and avoid repetitive studies using contrast within a close period of time, within 48 to 72 hours. In the, in the past, the, the contrast used was the high osmol agents, but they're not very, they're not used much, if at all, anymore. You guys can speak to that. So what we look at is either the isoosmol or the low osmol contrast agents. So they, some of the research shows specifically that the use of the iodaxanol or non-ionic low osmol agents are better than iohexol. The KDGO, which is the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcome Guidelines, they recommend low osmol as osmolol or isoosmolal rather than high osmolal contrast agents, but stated that the work group found no reliable evidence upon which to base a recommendation. This slide is just showing some of the research <clears throat> regarding the contrast mediums used. So again, they, they recommend not using the iohexol based off of what some of the studies showed. <clears throat> so with a meta-analysis that included 25 randomized trials, they used subjects that had um, known renal impairment or diabetes, and it showed a modest reduction in the risk of AKI with the iodoxanol. However, the small reduction is in risk is unlikely to be clinically meaningful although it was marginally statistically significant. There was no difference between groups in the risk for renal replacement therapy, cardiovascular outcomes, or death. <clears throat> and it is possible that the iohexol carries an increased risk of AKI compared with the non-iohexol low osmol agents. And this is another trial that showed that when they compared the io Diaxonal with the two other non-ionic non low osmo contrast agents, they found, oops, they found no difference between the groups in the incidence of AKI. So these data suggest that the benefit of the iodoxanol compared with the iohexol may represent a unique nephrotoxic effect of the contrast itself, iohexol. However, there are no trials comparing nephrotoxicity of the iohexol to other low osmo, osmolar agents. So in continuing with the recommendations, patients with near normal kidney function, they're at low risk for CAAKI. Therefore, there are very few, if any, interventions required, except the avoidance and or concern of volume depletion. In all at-risk patients undergoing an intra-arterial contrast administration, you should consider using IV hydration with isotonic IV fluid prior to the um, contrast administration to several hours after, unless it is contraindicated to do so because of a volume expanded state of the patient. 
or if the patient is volume overloaded. This is the standard of care despite insufficient data showing a benefit to this IV hydration, but we need further studies to um, assess how prophylactic fluid administration is beneficial. But it's again dependent upon if you're inpatient or outpatient when doing the contrast um, procedure and how you type how, what type of fluid administration is given. So as stated before, like in the poll questions, bicarbonate and acetylcysteine is no longer recommended. It showed no benefit. <coughs> and acetylcysteine has possible adverse events or adverse reactions. So if there's no benefit, it was decided there, there's no need to use it in the prevention. Mannitol and other diuretics given prophylactically, they're not recommended. However, if your patient is volume overloaded, then there that is an indication to use diuretics. <laughs> However, you want to avoid the volume depletion. So it's, again, trying to get that euvolemia. Prophylactic hemofiltration or hemodialysis after contrast exposure to prevent <coughs> CKAKE in chronic kidney patients is not recommended. <coughs> Patients on dialysis can be ESRD, or they can be acutely needing an acute injury needing dialysis. <clears throat> With those patients, they can still have some residual renal function. So we want to try to preserve those. So volume depletion is to be avoided. However, there is no hard or fast answer in the nephrology community at this time. Hemodialysis before contrast procedures is not a prevention. It's rather more of a curative intervention for a volume overloaded patient, or if you need to manage or correct any electrolyte disturbances they may have. There is no indication for prophylactic dialysis for the prevention of volume overload <coughs> from that contrast administration in dialysis dependent patients. <coughs> Furthermore, there are no studies that support immediate dialysis after intravascular contrast media administration in order to preserve residual kidney function or limit the risk of allergic or toxic reactions to the contrast in your hemodialysis patients. Whereas some clinicians try to perform this dialysis treatment within 24 to 36 hours after the contrast exposure, Others will wait 48 to 72 hours until the next scheduled hemodialysis treatment. The literature shows a support of waiting to the, um, for their regular scheduled dialysis unless there's a indication like a volume state or um, electrolyte disturbance that requires an immediate um, or sooner dialysis treatment. In regards to how we um, volume, how we give volume around the time of the procedure, there was a trial done that evaluated a new type of fluid protocol to prevent CIAKI. It was the Poisidon trial. <clears throat> Basically, it it guided. It was got. You had two groups, and one group was guided by the left ventricular end diastolic pressure compared with standard IV fluid administration among all the patients with an EGFR less than 60 or other and other risk factors. All patients, though, in both groups received IV isotonic saline at three milliliters per kilogram one hour prior to the cardiac cath. However, during the procedure, the LVEDP group received five milliliters per kilogram if they had a less than 13 millimeters of mercury LVEDP, or they would receive three milliliters if it was between 13 to 18 and 1.5 per kilogram per hour if it was greater than 18. The control group just received 1.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour. And the results showed that the LVEDP group had less occurrence of CAAKI than the control group. It was 6.7 to 16.3 respectively. And there were three patients in each group that had, I, the, that had to have the IV fluid discontinued due to them being symptomatic with dyspnea. So what are the adverse outcomes that we're concerned about? Well, we're, they, some of the adverse outcomes 
are they patients will have a longer hospital stay. They can develop cardiovascular events. They could have worsening renal function and increased mortality. So a lot of the studies measured these endpoints at 30 days, 60 day, et cetera. So it's not just immediately after, but af um, after a prolonged period of time as well. So I wanted to do a little bit of a clinical application to see if you feel comfortable. If, if you don't want to, you don't have to, but if you had a patient with end-stage renal disease that one was undergoing AV fistula creation, what would be the things you would consider doing now? So we know that the person is at risk. So the first thing is to make sure, anybody? Okay, just make sure they're not volume depleted, right? So I wanna make sure that they're, if they're fluid overloaded, that might be a reason why they need to have dialysis before. If they weren't good with their diet, <clears throat> they have hyperkalemia, you may wanna do it before, it's, et cetera. These may be some reasons, um, this, this may be how we can help reduce or prevent this CAAKI, this uh, injury. Um, with patients with normal kidney function undergoing a CT scan with contrast, again, we're not too worried, right? Because the contrast is venously given. So on, the only thing we really wanna make sure of is if they're on NSAIDs, we stop that 24 to 48 hours before and make sure they're not volume depleted. And then with your patient that has an EGFR less than 60 and has history of diabetes and they're undergoing angioplasty, we know that they're at high risk. So again, we just do the recommended um, prevention measures, which we've already identified them. We wanna make sure they're not volume depleted and then the type of contrast that we're using and the amounts. All right, here are my references. And then like you said, Sharon, this is gonna be available so that we can go back and we can look at the parts that uh, are relevant to future discussions we have and that'll be available to us on the website.